Amen. Good morning, everybody. Happy Resurrection Day to everybody on this beautiful Sunday morning. Let's all stand, please, and grab our blue songbook. We're going to go to number 31, number 31. We'll sing all three verses of He Lives. He Lives. He serve a risen Savior. Amen. Are you glad you're saved? Say amen. Let's sing all three verses. Number 31. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. And talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. And if Jesus lives in your heart, shout amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for a risen Savior. Wow. Every Sunday is a memorial of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we meet on Sundays, the first day of the week. Because why? He rose on the first day of the week. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. But on this special day, happy resurrection day to everybody. Amen. It's good to see everybody on this beautiful day. Amen. Let's bow for prayer and we will get started. Brother England, could you open us up in prayer, please? Amen. You may be seated. Turn to number 33. Number 33, Christ the Lord is risen today. Number 33, we'll sing the first, second, and the fourth verse. Number 33. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Hallelujah. Sing ye hymns and earth reply. Again, our glorious King, Alleluia. Where O death is now thy sting, Alleluia. Dying once he hold us safe, Alleluia. Where thy victory ring, O grave, Christ has led, Alleluia. Following our exalted 
exalted head. Alleluia. Made like him, like him we rise. Alleluia. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. Alleluia. Howdy. So Wednesday night on our way to church, a couple of deer crossed the road and they're heading from my backyard. And I, I don't know how many ended up in the backyard. And I, don't, I think they were having a secret meeting. <laughs> so then on the way to church, like one tried to cross the road in front of me. On the way home from church, a couple tried to cross the road in front of me. This morning, Brother Tony met me at my car and he, he said, I saw your buddies this morning. I, I, he didn't have to explain to me that he meant, he meant the white tails. <laughs> so I didn't see anybody. They must have been harassing him. So, so they're out there. Uh, they're just waiting. T today's letter is from the Rudda family, missionaries to New Zealand. Uh, they've been serving the Lord in New Zealand since 1988. And it's a February letter. Dear praying friends, greetings to all of you from the land down under. It's hard to believe that we are already well into the new year. January passed before we even knew it was filled with a flur as it was filled with a flurry of activity. Seems like the month of March gone just as fast. <laughs> we are so thankful to each of you that remembered us with cards and gifts over the holidays. It's always a special blessing to hear from friends back home and to hear what God is doing with you. God is so good to us. We are looking forward to what the Lord has planned for our church and ministries here in this new year. January is in the middle of the summer here, so it always begins with our family camp for the churches around the South Island. I've been blessed to be the director of the camp for a good number of years. Sometimes the weeks leading up to the camp can feel like herding cats <laughs> as we try to delegate all the jobs needed, but we always have dozens of volunteers that jump in to fill all the jobs. We have each of the pastors to preach, and each church provides special music, so our people get to see what the Lord is doing around the island. It is always an amazing time of preaching, singing, games, fellowship, and, by the end of the week, complete exhaustion. <laughs> this time, several decisions were made of those surrendering to do whatever the Lord would have them to do with their lives. This ministry was started over 20 years ago, and it has been a great tool to build and encourage Christians, and I believe that it has helped our churches to grow as our people realize they are not alone. We have reached new highs in attendance at our church over the last few months. Our building has a maximum capacity of about 80 in the auditorium, with chairs packed in tightly. We have had a few Sundays recently where we've had only 10 empty seats in the whole room. We are not seeing that every Sunday, but it is a beautiful thing to look out and see a room full as I preach. It took us many years of struggling to build the foundation and get here. We are having discussions of what our next steps will be if we keep growing. We can open a bifold type door into the adjoining room and add another 10 to 15 seats, which can see the pulpit. That will help for a while. I honestly feel blessed. Prayer requests. First, I would appreciate your prayers for Diana. She injured her knee several months ago, and this has greatly limited her mobility. For the last few months, she has been seeing a physical therapist, and they have helped a bit, but we are still concerned. Next, we have had visitors in our services over the last few weeks that are from a variety of doctrinal backgrounds. Prayers are appreciated that we can reach out to them, welcoming them, while also discipling them and guiding them to sound doctrine. Last, please pray for our institute classes as we are trying to train and challenge our people to serve the Lord. I have enjoyed listening to some of our men teaching and preaching recently. I have told them that I see definite growth and depth in their messages and preparations. Yours for souls in New Zealand, Bob and Diana Rudda. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for Brother Rudda and the many, many years he served there in New Zealand. I pray that you'd continue to bless him, help him to... Uh, figure out the best solution to, uh, to the church growth and that, that they get the proper building for them and continue to reach out to the New Zealanders. I pray, Lord, that um, you'll bless in this Easter Sunday morning that you'll 
that will see souls saved. If there's somebody here that doesn't know you as the Lord, that, that um, we can share in the resurrection, in your resurrection, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord for the great work he's doing there in New Zealand. Praise the Lord for that. I want to encourage you again to be, prayer, being prayer, be in prayer with the Lord to have you do for missions. I'm telling you, you can't get out give the Lord. You cannot give the Lord. Amen. I want to take the time to recognize uh, some new newer faces. And uh, Brother England, uh, could you introduce your, your guest? And uh, this is my son. He's from Yes, that's good. Nathaniel, great, great to have you. Great to have you. I know a lot of people. Oh, amen. Amen. Well, it's good that good to hear that everything's going well. So we've been praying for you and all, all the big move and the, the big uh, step that you're going to be taking in life. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. All right. Anybody else? Miss Sonia? Is this Thea? That's right. That's right. Good to see you. I'm trying to make sure I knew the name. So, and Thea, you have somebody with you. Who's this? Zach, great to have you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Miss uh, Tanya, you have a special someone next to you? Good to see you, Arthur, again. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thanks for spending Resurrection Day with us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Chantel, it's always good to have you. Amen. It's Olivia's mom. She so graciously allows Olivia to come every, nearly every week uh, on, the, on the routes. Olivia is such a treasure to our hearts. And, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for letting her come. Amen. Just a couple of announcements, and then we'll go to our next song. Um, uh, the, jo the Eric Johansson's uh, memorial service, I had been announcing that it's going to be coming up uh, in a couple Saturdays. Miss Johansson, be in prayer for her. She had hip surgery on Friday. So be in prayer for her. She had a fall, and she, they said they need to do the hip surgery like right now. And so um, depending on her recovery... Um, that date may change on his memorial service. So just to uh, make a mental note of that, reach out to her, let her know you're praying for her, and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch as far as what the family decides as far as uh, a memorial service for him. So um, just that's going to be on pause for now. Uh, there will be an a, a, a um, shower for Mrs. Daniel. She's going to be having a little girl in June. Praise the Lord. And, uh, looking forward to that. Amen. So that will be on April 20th here at the church at noon downstairs so uh, I just put that on your calendar. If you ordered flowers for the Easter Sunday, thank you, first of all, for making the church always look so beautiful on Easter Sunday. But uh, if you um, won't be able to make it for the evening service, please feel free to take your flower home and, and enjoy it. And uh, thank you so much for, for helping us out. I want, also uh, want to wish Miss uh, Ramsey a happy birthday. She's got a birthday coming up, so reach out to her this week. Brother Bunny, happy birthday. Have, you have a birthday coming up this week. And then reach out to Brother Donovan Berkey Pyle. He's got a birthday coming up. And Miss Johansson, she has a birthday on Saturday. So I want to make sure that, uh, that we know about those, those birthdays. Amen. Let's grab our songbooks. We're going to go to number 36 as we stand in preparation for the scripture reading. The follow number 36, Christ Arose. Number 36. We'll sing all three verses. Think of the words as you sing. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watched his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord, up 
up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes he arose the victor of the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign he arose he arose hallelujah christ arose death cannot keep his frame jesus my savior he tore the bars away jesus my lord up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes he arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign he arose he arose hallelujah christ arose hallelujah amen Amen. Are you glad that Jesus arose? Say amen. Amen. Let's grab our Bibles. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And ask Brother Tony if he would come and lead us in our scripture reading from Hebrews chapter 12. Good morning. Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. We'll be in chapter 12. We'll be reading verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Let's read all four verses together. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which the will see easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Amen. Let's pray. Father, it's good to be back in your house as we celebrate Easter, Lord. We celebrate the resurrection, the empty tomb, Lord. For without the resurrection, we would We'd be most miserable of men, Lord. There would be no hope for us, Lord. So we thank you for what Christ did, his, his obedience, Lord, to go into the cross, to suffer and die for our sins, for our iniquities, Lord. And we owe him everything, Lord. May we be listening today, Lord, and apply what you speak to our hearts, through our pastor, Lord, fill him with the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. May we be obedient to what you want us to do and follow through with it, Lord, and leave the results to you. We thank you for all that are here today, Lord, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
King of heaven, victory is sure. Down the halls of time, his words forever ring. Hear his voice, make your choice, run him king. It is finished, the battle is over. It is finished, through God's own son. It is finished, glory, hallelujah. ladies and what a what a message praise the lord it is finished amen 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 if you're happy you're saved give a good hearty amen amen good good to have you here in the house of god on resurrection sunday in hebrews chapter 12 i want us to focus on two words in verse two it says looking unto jesus the author the author I've told you a little bit about my family's history over the years, how that my great-grandma, and this is like six or seven greats back, Grandma Selma from Finland had a falling out with her stepmom about what was the argument, stolen money or something. And she ended up running away from homes, getting on a boat, stowing away on a boat, coming here to America. My great, 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 great grandpa Pavo, which is Paul in Finnish, he came over in, and that was my son, grandma Selma came over in 1903. My grandpa Pavo came over in 1905. Ended up in New York, and then they traveled to Portland, Oregon area, and that's where my grandpa, grandma Selma and grandpa Pavo met. Just a, the, the, the likelihood of it happening. I had my great-grandparents, they met, they uh, uh, were in Portland, Oregon when my grandmother uh, got uh, pregnant out of wedlock, she's in heaven now, but she got pregnant out of wedlock and she was taken by my great-grandfather to a home for unwed mothers and left there. My great-grandma and great-grandpa, they were there in the Portland, Oregon area around the time of Billy Sunday. I'm sorry, not Billy Sunday, uh, Billy Graham, sorry. Billy Graham and went to one of his crusades, and they ended up coming to Christ and getting saved. Around that same time, there was a pamphlet left on my grandma's bed there at the shelter, and she too got saved. And God began to work in their hearts and brought them back together. And my great-grandpa and great-grandma decided, you know what? We're going to take our daughter back, and we're going to help her raise this child. That child was... Ellen, my oldest aunt. Ellen, she ended up going to Bob Jones University where she married Bill Katka, and they've been in Christian service for the last 45 years. But my great-grandpa, he went over to Pearl Harbor in that area. My grandpa, he was there, and he's from Texas, Canton, Canton Texas area. He was over in uh, the... Uh, Hawaiian Islands in the Naval Service. His commanding officer told him, you have to eat everything you put on your plate. He loved spinach. So he put a spoonful of spinach on his plate. That's probably where I got the, that taste for that uh, good, healthy stuff from. Yuck. <laughs> All in favor of excommunicating Brother Tony, say aye. Get out. You done did the cardinal sin there. You ruined a happy resurrection Sunday. Did you have to mention that? No, but uh, he, he, he smelled the, the spinach, and he, he was thinking there's something wrong with this. It's spoiled or rotten. I'm going to end up getting sick. So he throws it away. Well, his commanding officer said, you throw it away. You're in punishment. He's like, if I eat it, I'm going to get sick. Well, his punishment was that he had to go to Pearl Harbor. 
and be in the communications. Evidently, communications was less uh, thrilling than what he was doing. So it was considered punishment. Well, it was in Pearl Harbor that he came across uh, Mr. Willett, who was his bunkmate, who invited him to church on a New Year's Eve service. There at the New Year's Eve service, he met the young people, and then a few weeks later, there was a birthday party for a young lady there, Phyllis Joanne Passanen. And at that party, him and Phyllis Joanne Passanen started getting to know each other. Phyllis Joanne Passanen is my grandma with her little girl, Ellen. And they started courting and ended up getting married. And It's the grace of God. This is the grace of God. You, many, many people at the end of their life, they'll go back and they'll write about what happened and what transpired. In fact, my, my uncle, who's a family historian, he is uh, in the process of studying our family history just because the, every time we turn around, it's like a story of God's grace here and God's grace here and God's grace here and God's grace here. God's grace here. According to what I was told by my aunts and uncles that either my great-grandpa or somebody connected to him that would have determined and, and changed our family history, he was on one of the last boats to leave Pearl Harbor at the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Talk about God's grace. Amen. That's my family story. God's grace. It's a story of Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good them who love God, to them who are called according to purpose. If you were to write a story about your life, what details would you include? Would you include only the good details? See, my, my, my uh, uncle can't release some of the family history because there are some details that would embarrass people still living. But if you were to do that, would you do the same? I want us to look at the story that Jesus wrote. It says in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author. The title of the message this morning is Jesus authored his biography before he came. Who, who else can do that? <laughs> he authored his autobiography before he came. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending him. Jesus, we want to thank you for your tender heart and your immense, immense love for your Heavenly Father and for what your Father loves, and that would be us. And you pinning, writing this plan, this story of your own life. Thank you. Thank you. I pray that you please help us to appreciate it. And that you put yourself through all of what you suffered because you love us. Please speak to our hearts this morning. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. When we read this portion of Scripture, many times we focus on that phrase in verse 2 that says, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And it is a great thought. Jesus did endure the cross. He did endure the punishment for our sin. It should have been us that was nailed to that cross. It says in the Word, in Acts, that Jesus went about doing good. How do you justify crucifying somebody who has gone around doing good and being a blessing to everybody? How do you... How do you get the public to, to shout, crucify him, crucify him, and go along with that plan. But he endured that cross. He endured that contradiction of sinners, as Hebrews says in verse 3. And there's something, certainly nothing wrong with focusing on that phrase and that thought, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, something great to meditate on. But I want to look at something else. There's many times we speed read over portions of the Scripture. We don't fully appreciate and contemplate on the words of the Word of God. 
I want us to concentrate on the words, those two words, the author, Jesus, the author. Again, if you were to write your story beforehand, if you were to write and predict your, your life, what would you write? Would you write what Jesus wrote into his story? It says that Jesus is an author. This story of redemption was something that he penned himself. Acts 2.23 says it was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Before time ever began, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all got together and said, now how, how can we redeem our creation that has turned away from us? And they put this plan together. It's something that he penned down himself. He counted the cost. Something that he volunteered for. I love that hymn that says, tell me the story of Jesus Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest peace and good tidings of, to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Let's look at the details of this story. That Jesus himself contemplated, thought up, meditated on, mulled around in his head, considered all the costs. As he's praying Gethsemane, he says, except this cup, ex this cup, except I drink it, thy will be done. He was contemplating the part in the expression, the sewage of man's sin. He says, this cup, except I drink it. Yeah. Repulsive. But he wrote it into his story. Wow. If you were to write your own story, what details would you include? Jesus wrote this story. I want us to look at the details of his story. Turn in your Bibles, hold your place there in Hebrews chapter 12. Turn over to Revelations. I want us to, to look at something that Jesus enjoyed and something that is an attribute and what Jesus will be known for and should be known for even today. Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. I want to read a few scriptures. <clears throat> Revelation 19 and verse 11, it says, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of, of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. What an imposing picture. What an imposing figure. What a, what a mighty figure. But that's the end. It wasn't the beginning. What kind of story did Jesus write? Number one, it was a humbling story. It was a humbling story. In Philippians 2 and verse 8 it says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, it's one thing to die. It was another thing to die on a Roman cross. That was not a glorified death. He was, he was, Isaiah says he was numbered with the transgressors. He died with criminals. As the story teaches us and tells us, he, he had two thieves on either, either side. He died among common thieves. 
It wasn't a martyr's death. You've heard of these great martyrs who took a stand for their faith. They were burned at the stake or, or, or their, their heads were cut off for their faith in the word of God and, and, and their, their belief in, in, in how God was leading them. This was not a glorified death. This was a humbling death. That was the end. But look at the beginning in Luke chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Why was he born in a manger? Because there was no room for them in the end. Couldn't Jesus have chosen? Did Jesus not author his story? Could he have not chosen richer parents to be born to? Why did he choose to be born to poor parents who couldn't even afford a room in the inn so he could identify with everybody so that there would be nobody that would think, I can't reach up to that. It was a humbling story on purpose. Where did the king of kings write in his story where he would be born? In a manger. Who would he be born to? He'd be born to poor parents. But why in a manger? The manger is a place where the sacrificial lamb for the temple was placed for observation before it would be sacrificed. Isn't that interesting? That's what the manger... We have this idea that the manger is the food trough. No, it's a, it's a stone slab that they would put this little lamb in so the lamb couldn't fall out and it couldn't get scratched on wood because it ha could not have a blemish. So this stone was smoothed all the, way, all the way around so that they could observe it and make sure that it was without blemish because it would be the sacrifice in the temple. It was a humbling story. Number two, it was an anticlimactic story. Think about it. The Old Testament covers about 3,300 years. God the Father used that time in the Old Testament to foretell of what he had promised in Genesis chapter 3. You remember the fall of man? He said that the seed of woman would crush the head of the serpent and the serpent would bite his heel. And God the Father was promising that the sin of man would be cared for in time. This Messiah would come. So for over 3,000 years, God is foretelling through the prophets and through the writings of the Old Testament. But I want you to notice, after all of that foretelling, notice how many people were there to welcome him. If you jot this verse down in Luke chapter 2, verse 25, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and about waiting for the consolation of Israel, speaking of the Messiah, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. So there was a man. How many men would that be? One. A man. Okay. Verse 36 of the same chapter, it says, And there was one Anna. She coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and she and spake of him to all them that looked for the redemption in Jerusalem. So there was a man and one Anna. So after 3,300 years approximately of foretelling in the Old Testament, throngs of multitudes should have been there to welcome Jesus at his dedication ceremony in the temple. But how many people were there? Two. Talk about anticlimactic. You're, you're, you're getting ready for this, this, this fun day. You're getting ready for this, this exciting event that's going. That's, 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 this is kind of how I feel when it comes to like a friend day or some big day at the church. You know, we do all this planning and, and I'm all worried that morning. Nobody's going to show up. Nobody's going to show up. Nobody's. My family's not even going to show up. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. You better. No. But you're worried. Oh, my God. Because you don't want it to be a letdown. 
one man and one woman, two humans out of how many show up for his dedication ceremony at the temple eight days after he was born? If you were to write your story, what, would you include those details in your story? But Jesus wrote these things into his story. He wrote a humbling story, an anticlimactic story. In fact, Isaiah 53 says that he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. John 1.1 1, 1 says that he came unto his own, and his own received him not, even after 3,300 years of foretelling. Number three, it was a delayed climax story. It was a delayed climax story. After experiencing this sin-filled world for 12 years, after such a humble beginning, can you imagine what Jesus, he just wanted to go back home. If you read in Revelation, he was adored, he was worshipped by all the hosts of heaven. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, glory and honor and worthy is the Lamb. He would receive, he would receive all this adoration throughout all of eternity past. And now he's down in the sewage pond of the earth. Don't you think he would want to get out as quick as possible? At 12 years old, it talks about how that he went to the temple and his parents, they left thinking he was with the crowd and couldn't find him. And then they came back and he was in the temple questioning the religious leaders and they said, Jesus, you've, you've had us worried. And he said, did you, wist you not that I must be about my father's business? Don't you remember why I came? John 17 speaks of the real Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer that the world uses is more of a model prayer. In John 17, we see Jesus actually praying to his father. Look what he says. Go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 and verse 1. John 17 and verse 1, it says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus wanted to go back home after 12 long years of experience in the cesspool of sinful earth. As we talked about in Luke chapter 2, where he was left in the temple and asked his mom, how, how, how is it that you wist, how is it that you sought me? Wist you not that I must be about my father's business? Mom, don't you remember the angels and what they said to you? And don't you remember the... Before I was born, what they told you? Luke 2, verse 50 says, They understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And then it says, He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. What was his father's business? The redemption of mankind. To pull all of mankind out of the sewage pond of that horrible pit. And to save them. What was the climax of that redemption plan? It was being sacrificed as was shown in the figure of Abraham and Isaac in the Old Testament. How Abraham was told, go sacrifice your son, your only son, the one that you love. And Abraham attempted to sacrifice Isaac and God stopped him. But Jesus, he was going to be the sacrifice. Jesus wanted to go back home. He wanted to get it over with. He said in verse 5 of John 17, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Before all the first statement of creation, let there be light. 
Jesus was enjoying glory in heaven with the Father. But the climax would have to wait. And Jesus delayed his return home. And as Luke 2.51 says, he went down with Mary and Joseph and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. That word subject means to subordinate, to obey, to be under obedience, to subdue under, be a subject unto. Wow, what a story. The king of kings became a subject to Mary and Joseph. This royalty of royalties became a subject. Just think of the paradox there. But not only subject to them, but also, as Philippians 2, 8 says, and being found in fashion of man, he, became, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So this king of kings not only became a subject to a mother and a father, but he also became a subject unto death. He permitted death to rule over him until his father said so. The death of a cross, a criminal's death. Why obedient unto death? Because Romans 5.17, it says, For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more are they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. But Jesus had written into his story this clause. Romans 6 verse 9 says, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. No more rule, no more reign. Remember in Revelation 19 and verse 16, it says, He that hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Lord of lords was now lorded over in the story that this author, Jesus, wrote. It was a humbling story that Jesus wrote. It was an anticlimactic story, and a letdown. It was a delayed climax story. Number four, it was a prolonged story. He went to the temple at 12 years old, but then it says in Luke chapter 3, and Jesus began to be about 30 years of age when he began his earthly ministry. That's 18 plus years. 18 more years he had to sit here and endure the cesspool of this earth. Why did it take so long before fulfilling the Father's plan? Was he waiting for his publicly recognized earthly father, Joseph, to release him or for him to pass on before he could continue with his heavenly father's plan? John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 17.11 says, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world and I come to thee. And now it was time for Jesus to start thinking about going back home, but there were still more details to his story. Turning your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. Number five, it was a story of disrespect and betrayal. It was a story of disrespect and betrayal. Luke chapter 22 and verse 3, it says, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised... And sought opportunity to betray him. John 6.71, it says that Judas Iscariot was the son of one Simon. John 12.4 also mentions that Judas Iscariot was Simon's son. John 13 and verse 2, it talks about how that Judas Iscariot, again, at the end of supper, the devil having now put in his heart to betray him. John 13, 26, it talks about Judas Iscariot being the son of Simon. And in Matthew 26, it talks about Jesus going to Simon the leper's house. And there was this woman who came with the alabaster box, and she broke it and did him homage and did him honor. And in that verse 14 of Matthew 26, it says, this is, this, Then one of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests. And that's where he covenanted together with them for 30 pieces of silver. That was Matthew's side of the story. Mark said that Jesus was in the house of Simon the leper. He sat at meat, tells the story about the woman with the alabaster box, and also tells of how that Jesus Iscariot, he was one of the twelve, went into the chief priests to betray him. 
and agreed for a certain price. Luke also tells the story. In Luke's version of the story, he tells about how these, this Pharisee invites him to his house. This woman does this honor to him. And the man, the head of the house, it has the same markings as the story of Simon the leper. But this man did him no, no customary cordialities. If, if you had somebody who came to your house uh, in the middle of wintertime and they were all bundled up with a coat, what, what, would, what would be a customary hospitable thing to do? Hey, can I take your coat? Right? Don't just sit there all bundled. Hey, take off your coat and stay a while, as they say. Right? Uh, or if in your house you take off your shoes, you know, hey, can I take your shoes? Just common courtesies. In Luke chapter 7, verse 43, it says, Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most, and he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house, thy house, thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. It was customary to wash your guests' feet because of the dusty roads and the open shoes that they wore to make them comfortable. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. You disrespected me. You didn't even give me a common courtesy. But she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Verse 45 says, Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't even show me any love. You disrespected me. You didn't show me any love. Verse 46, My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. You dishonored me. You disrespected me. You didn't show me any love. You dishonored me. Simon the leper was such an ungracious host to the Savior. So many times it's mentioned that Judas Iscariot was Simon's son. It makes me wonder if Simon was actually Judas's father. The scriptures don't definitively say it. It leads one to believe and imply be, that be implied. But for the sake of argument, let's say that they are. This Simon, the leper father of Judas, did he breed betrayal in his home? And Jesus wrote this all in his story. He wrote it all in his story. He wrote in this allowance for his own creation to disrespect him and, dis and betray him. What a story. What a story. Number six, it was a sacrificial story. It was a sacrificial story. It says in Acts 10, 38, that Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good. Went about doing good. And when, Jesus, when John's disciples came to Jesus asking him if he was indeed the Messiah, Jesus answered in Luke 7 by going about and doing more good. John the Baptist, he says, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in the same hour he, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits and of Unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard, how the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are erased, and the poor, to the poor the gospel is preached. When Jesus was doubted by the greatest prophet, who Jesus said was John the Baptist, how did he answer that question? By doing more good. He went about doing good. But it was a sacrificial story because after doing good to his society for three years, this is how they repay him. Mark 15, 13. They cried unto him, cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate, the Roman authority, says, why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, crucify him. This man who went about doing good and the crowd now is telling the Roman authority, crucify him. 
after they got their wish and they saw him crucified, how did Jesus respond? He requested one more good thing. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then Jesus said, it is finished. But he wasn't finished there. Only part of the price had been paid for sin. On this resurrection morning that we're celebrating in John chapter 20, it tells what happens that resurrection morning. It says that Jesus saith unto her, Mary, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my father. And go, go to my brethren and say to them, I ascended to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Why did he say that? Because almost all things are by the law purged with blood, but without the shedding of blood is no remission. Jesus still needed to sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, the one that sets before God. He went about doing good, and he wrote all of these details in his story. All of these things he wrote in his story about himself. He wrote these humbling parts in his story, these anticlimactic parts, these delayed climax, these prolonged details, this, these details of disrespect and betrayal, of sacrifice. And number seven, it's an inspiring story. In Acts chapter one, it says in verse eight, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto other most parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Can you imagine? While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go to heaven. He wrote a story where he would be humiliated. He wrote a story where his coming would be anticlimactic, even after 3,300 years of foretelling. He wrote a story where the climax would have to be delayed and he would have to stay longer than, he, than what he wanted. He wrote a story where the plot would be prolonged. He wrote a story where he would be disrespected and betrayed. He wrote a story where he would be the sacrifice. There would be no replacement. He would have to drink that cup. He, was, he wrote a story that would be an inspiration to all. What a story. But even greater than the story is the author. The author. You see, back in the Old Testament, there was a man called Uriah. Uriah, he was written. It was written by the hand of David to Joab, set Uriah in the hottest battle, and then pull all the forces away from him and let him die. And Uriah never opened that up, never knew what was in that letter. He was carrying to Joab his own death sentence. But David authored it. Jesus authored his own death sentence. Why? Why? First John 4, 19, it says, because he first loved us. He first loved us. So during this time of the year, remember, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And keep your eyes on Jesus, the author. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for going through all what you went through to spend 33-plus years here on earth. To rescue our despicable souls. Loving us in such a deep and special way. We praise you and thank you. And our hearts desire you to receive all the honor and the glory that you deserve. Especially on this, your, the anniversary of your resurrection. Pray, Heavenly Father, you please help us to determine this year we're going to live more and more in honor of that resurrection and help us to understand that each Sunday, each Sunday is a memorial of that resurrection, the first day of the week. 
We gather together just like the first century Christians do. When they gather together after the resurrection of Jesus, we follow that pattern. And the scriptures also say they met again that evening. Thank you. Thank you for all that you did. All that you did for us. We're very undeserving of it. And that this news, the news of this story would reach our ears and our lives is by the pure grace of God. Lord, I look back in my own family history. If, if, if my great-grandparents had not left Finland, I would be a Lutheran now and I'd be on my way to hell. I would be believing that works would be the thing that would save me. Probably not even know the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the religious... The, the, the church situation over there in Finland is so, so heavy and so, so dark. Can't even imagine where I would be. But by the grace of God, you, you brought my family over here and the gospel reached my ears and my heart. Thank you. Help us, Lord, to reflect on that and how that story reached our ears and our life and help us, Lord, to take full advantage of it. Jesus did that for us. He authored his biography before he was born. He said, I'm going to suffer these things. And then came down and suffered them. It's one thing to, Heavenly Father, look back and reflect on the trials of life and to See how you brought a person through and see your grace. But it's another thing to predict it and then knowing all he would endure still come. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We lift you up and we praise you. We honor and glorify you as you deserve all glory and praise and honor. We dedicate this day to you and we love you. Thank you for loving us. Laying down your life for us. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Some have missed play in the of invitation. How about you take some time to thank Jesus Christ for what he's done for you? Are you a child of his? Have you received him as your Savior? How about you thank, thank the Lord for bringing the message of salvation to you? And all of what he did to make that possible, he brought that news to you. That should fill our hearts with so much gratefulness. And so much awe for all that he did. And he chose to do it. He wrote it beforehand and then suffered it. He still came. Knowing all he would endure, he still came. Let's pray.
Let's go to our blue songbook and go to number 174. We'll sing the first and second verse of My Jesus, I Love Thee. Number 174, we'll sing this as our closing hymn. Think of the words as you sing. Numbers 174. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, art Thou. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love Thee because Thou hast first loved me. And purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus. Jesus is now. Amen. I encourage you. Continue meditating on the verse, Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, the throne of God. So much truth. But just thinking about Jesus, the author, and all those things that he wrote beforehand, and yet he still came. Wow. We're so undeserving. Mankind, on the whole, is so undeserving, yet he still came. Wow. That ought to bring a lot of humility to our hearts that we're not as big time as what we think we are. He still came. He still came. Amen. May we reflect on that today and give him the honor and glory that he is due on this special day. Amen. Let's bow for prayer. We'll be dismissed. Brother Tony, could you pray for us, please?